Many of you have never seen me be dollars. So that's philosophy number one. Wait for the government to change the minimum wage. You say, well, that might take too long. Is there another philosophy? And the answer is yes. Okay. Here's the second philosophy. Wait for the company to pay you $6 an hour. Right? You get a review how often? Every six months, let's say. You missed it. You waited a year. Maybe you didn't make it then. You say, well, no telling how long. If you've got a thousand people with you, maybe you could force the company to change it from five to six. If there were enough of you that said, we will not work, we demand six dollars, or we will not work. By yourself, not a good philosophy. Together with others, it could work. Right? Here's what we call this, the philosophy of demand. I demand more money. Alone, too risky. Together, maybe you could get some progress. So now we've covered three philosophies. Number one, wait for the government. Number two, wait for the company. Number three, the philosophy of demand, which is a bit risky. Here's the problem with the philosophy of demand. You can't get rich. If people only understood, starting at the lower end of the economic scale, that you cannot get rich by demand, now someone says, well, in America, how could you become wealthy? And the answer is to develop a new philosophy. And let me give you that. It might be the best I've got for the whole day. It's called the philosophy of performance. The philosophy of performance. I will perform so well, it would be embarrassing for the company not to pay me $6. Then I would perform so well, it would be embarrassing for the company not to pay me $8 an hour, $10 an hour, $20 an hour. So now we've got several philosophies going, and if you want to change your economic future, it starts with your personal philosophy. Okay. Now, here's what's interesting in America. I'm sure all of us can think of someone who makes $5 an hour getting started. Can anybody in the audience think of someone who makes $50 an hour? Do you happen to know anyone that makes $50 an hour? Anybody know somebody that makes about that much money? So jot this down now because you've got to teach it to the children because they're not teaching this in, in the ordinary schools. It's possible in America to multiply your income by 10. If you take nothing else home economically to pass on to your children or to someone else, just take that phrase home. Jim Rohn taught us it's possible in America to multiply your income by 10. It's possible. If kids knew it was possible, do you think they would ask, how can you do that? If they knew it was possible, wouldn't the next question would be, how could I do it? If it's possible, how can I do it? Now you just teach them how to do it. How to multiply your income by 10. Now, jot this down. A good economic question. Once you've multiplied your income by 10, is it possible to multiply it by 10 again? Not only to multiply it by 10, but to multiply your income by 10 again. Do you know anybody that makes $500 an hour? Can you think of someone makes $500 an hour? Right, my Beverly Hills lawyer makes more than $500 an hour. So jot this down. It's not only possible in America to multiply your income by 10, it's possible to multiply it by 10 again. Do you think kids would be excited to hear this philosophy? I'm sure they would. How can you multiply your income by 10 and then multiply it by 10 again? Now, if you multiplied it by 10 and then multiplied it again by 10, would it be possible, would it be possible to multiply it by 10 again? Can you think of anybody that makes $5,000 an hour? What, what do you think I get paid? I mean, this is such exciting stuff. I'm a kid from the farms of Idaho. I was 25 years old before I learned 
that you could multiply your income by 10 and then multiply it by 10 again and then multiply it by 10 again. This is mind-boggling stuff. $5,000 an hour. Now, would it be possible? Would it be possible to multiply it by 10 again? $50,000 an hour. Now, here's a good expression to use, especially for this group. You're all tuned in, especially the last couple of days. The best expression is, of course. Could you multiply your income by 10? Of course. Could you do it again? Of course. Could you do it again? Could you do it one more time? $50,000 an hour. You know, I've lectured with uh, General Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell. I had lunch once with Colin Powell, Colin Powell a few years ago. Schwarzkopf gets about $65,000 for a one-hour speech. $65,000. So how could you finally get to $50,000 an hour? Answer, become a general in the army. <laughs> yes. And lead the troops in the Gulf War. But what I'm trying to say is the possibilities here let's just say, are just unlimited. You can multiply your income by 10, then you can multiply it by 10 again, and you can multiply it by 10 again. Now, we're only talking economic values. There's all kinds of other values in terms of personal development, but this is it. Now, to climb this ladder, here's the possibilities. 63 million last year, one person earned. The possibilities, we would have to say, in our country, is what we call unlimited. Now, to climb this ladder as high as you wish to climb it, jot this phrase down now because I don't think I'll talk about anything more valuable than what I'm about to share with you. Here it is. To climb this ladder of economically as high as you wish to climb it, here's all you have to do. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I understood that philosophy, it totally changed my life. I made my first fortune by age 32, starting at age 25. And I've made and lost a few fortunes since then. That one simple philosophy, that it's possible to multiply your income by 10, and then by 10, and then by 10, by 10. And here's the simple way to do it. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Here's how it was put to me. If you work hard on your job, you can make a living, which is fantastic. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune, which is super fantastic. At age 25, I went to work on myself. The difference in my economic future was so startling even in the early years, that I never went back to the old ways. I never went back to the old philosophy. I never went back to the old discipline. I accepted the new ones, and it changed my life forever. Unbelievable. Here, here it is in philosophical terms. Just jot this phrase down. This is a good one. Success is something you attract. by becoming an attractive person. Success is not something you pursue. Success is something you attract by the person you become, by becoming an attractive person. Now, what could you think of that would start to make you more attractive to the marketplace? This is such simple ABC stuff, okay? Let me give it to you. Let me start with this. Jim Rohn's view of the 21st century. <clears throat> We've begun a new century, 21. <clears throat> We've begun a new millennium, number seven. Some scholars hold great significance to this seventh millennium. And I think it's probably true. It's gonna be 
the most extraordinary time in the history of the human race, I think. And these opening years now of the new millennium and the new century, <clears throat> how could you take advantage of this extraordinary time in human history and make for yourself an extraordinary life? Because it's all possible. So jot this little quote down now. It's one of the best I've come up with, I think, lately. And I'll just quote it slowly so you can jot it down and take it home. Here it is. From testimonials and from personal experience, we have enough information to conclude that it's possible to design and build and live an extraordinary life. From testimonials and from personal experience, we have enough information to conclude that it's possible to design and build and live an extraordinary life. I'd like to have you think about that, not just here, but even after you've gone back home. Think about it at least often enough to say, I think that's true. From testimonials and from personal experience, we have enough information to conclude that it's possible, it's not a guarantee, but it's possible to design and build and live an extraordinary life. Now, if you believe that and accept it, you just simply use that as a foundation, as the fundamentals. So now jot this down. Jim Rohn's view of the 21st century. Number one, unprecedented opportunity. Unprecedented opportunity. These are probably going to be the most extraordinary times in the history of the human race, 6,000 years of recorded history. We got through the last millennium. We especially got through the last century, a bloody century, the 20th century. Hopefully those major wars of devastation and destruction are behind us. World War II claimed 50 million lives. 19 million of them were Russian. The devastation of the 20th century was unparalleled and unprecedented. The savagery was unbelievable. The Holocaust was insanity of the most unbelievable kind. Hopefully that is in the century past. And that we have a new chance in a new century to build a new world and a new country and a new future. With all of the challenges, with Saddam Hussein, with the terrorists and all the rest, once the walls came down, about 12, 13 years ago, and I was just in Berlin the other day lecturing and had a chance to go to the Brandenburg Gate, Checkpoint Charlie, see part of the old Berlin Wall. Once those walls came down 13 years ago, the world now has forever changed. Because here's how the history of the human race reads. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. Sometimes more difficulty than opportunity. The history of the human race reads tyranny and liberty. Sometimes more tyranny than liberty. But now the world has totally changed. Since communism is on the run, the dictators, most of them are all gone. When I used to lecture years ago in South America, every country had a dictator. Now they're all gone. Castro and a few are left, but that's it. And they will soon all be gone. Within a short little period of the rest of our lifetime, all the dictators will be gone. A new wave of economic uniqueness, capitalism, free enterprise, liberty, freedom, democracy is absolutely sweeping the world. So for a long dark time, there was more tyranny than liberty. Here's what is unique about this new century 21, more liberty than tyranny. More freedom than oppression. This is an unprecedented time.
unbelievable opportunity. We have the technology to accomplish the most incredible things. We pick up a telephone now and talk to somebody on the other side of the world with ease. It's incredible. We fly, we've got transportation. I get on an airplane, 13 hours later, I'm in Hong Kong. Five meals, three movies, and you're there. I mean, it's unbelievable. I leave at 7.30 this evening to fly all night to Orlando to speak to another group uh, tomorrow in Orlando. It's amazing. With the jets, you can cover the world. I fly the Concorde, three hours London, New York. If you fly the Concorde, you can see two sunsets in one day. If you're in London, when the sun goes down, you fly the Concorde to New York, you watch the sun go down for the second time. I told the group at our little breakfast meeting this morning, if you fly the Concorde due west, the sun comes up in the west. If you haven't tried that, you must try it. On the Concorde, you meet unique people. I met Henry Kissinger on the Concorde. Henry said, I had breakfast in Paris, I'm having lunch here in London. I'm having dinner tonight in New York. If you fly the Concorde. Before his accident, I met Christopher Reeves a couple of times on the Concorde. Said to my business partner, we're going to be OK. Superman's on this plane. <laughs> this is unprecedented opportunity now, the 21st century and the beginning of the seventh millennium. These are extraordinary times. Now, here's number two. However. Keen competition, world competition. We're dealing now with Iraq. A big part of it is competition. Hopefully the nations of the world will settle a big share of their differences so we can develop unique economic, social, personal prosperity for the future with limited conflicts. No more horrors, no more holocaust, hopefully. But with the human race, you always have to keep your fingers crossed. Who knows? But I think it's going to be a time of unprecedented opportunity, but unique competition. Now, to take advantage of the 21st century and this opening of the new millennium, how could you use the opportunity? Mind. Now that you've arrived, told me your story, I'm beginning to see the light. Words. The old prophet said this, words are like a lamp for your feet so you can see where to walk. And words are like a light for your pathway so you can see where to go. With words, you can show somebody where to step and where to go. I said a little prayer before I left my hotel room this morning and asked God to give me a little stronger gift of words today so that my words might have meaning. Maybe I've caught you at just the right time. Maybe this is the moment for you. And if I can say something uniquely enough, using the English language best as I can, words are sometimes clumsy when you try to express what's going on in your head, let alone your heart. But if I can do a, as good a job as I possibly can in the session we've got this morning and then again this afternoon, by the time I'm finished, Maybe my words will help turn on another light for you. And you'll be able to see the possibilities better than you've ever seen it before. You'll be able to see yourself more successful than you've ever envisioned it before. If I can wisely say good words. Now, I've put communication in three parts because these, all three of these parts now help me make more fortunes. Here's the first one. It's called training. Training is simply showing somebody how to do the business, how to do the job. If you get good at that, the pay is incredible, whether it's your own enterprise or whether you work for someone else. Training pays big money. Here's the next one, teaching. And I've divided the two just to make the point. Teaching is more teaching life skills, life skills. Teach somebody how to set goals. Gary mentioned, right, making the list and checking them off. Today he gets to check one off. Jim Rohn arrives in San Jose, Santa Clara. I'm so excited about that. Teaching leadership, teaching management, teaching how to become powerful, gifted, influential. 
teaching father skills, mother skills. I've now, the last 15 years, learned grandfather skills. I set a goal when I became a grandfather to be one of the best grandfathers any grandchildren have ever had in the whole wide world. I practice it. I think about it. How to use my newfound life as a grandfather and learn every skill possible to dazzle my grandchildren. I'm one of the best. <laughs> so teach people how to be good fathers, good grandfathers, good mothers, good leaders in the community. Teach a minister how to teach. Teach a minister how to use the gift of language to persuade. So communication is part of its training, part of its teaching. Here's the best part, no, here's number three in the gift of language, and that's learning how to inspire. Inspire simply means a few simple things. Here's number one. Help people to see themselves better than they are. Yes, sometimes we have to help people see themselves as they are. If they've made mistakes, maybe that needs to be pointed out. If a child has messed up, sometimes you've got to say, you've messed up. But don't leave them in the mess. Now transport them into the future with the gift of your language. And inspire them with the person they can become by using the mistakes of the past to develop new disciplines for the future. A teacher I met when I was 25 years old had this unusual gift. He said, Mr. Owen, if you keep learning as you're learning now, one of these days you'll walk into a room full of people and you'll hear, you'll hear someone say, there's the man. That's the man. That's the famous man. I thought, well, that could never happen for me. Sure enough, it did. He said, it will happen. And I think when I walked in here this morning, I heard someone say, that's him. That's the man. That's the famous man. You must transport your children into the future. Yes, you have to take them back to review their mistakes, but don't leave them there. Now transport them into tomorrow. Transport your children into next week. Help them to see themselves 30 days from now, 90 days from now, six months from now. Help them to see themselves successful. It's your gift of language that can do that. Help them to have faith for themselves and faith for the future. The sacred writing says this, faith comes by hearing words, good words, somebody who well chooses their words and delivers them with uniqueness can inspire faith for somebody to believe the most impossible things can be possible. And those, that excitement of possibilities comes from hearing or reading unique words one of the best phrases I could give you for the day here it is don't be lazy in language don't be lazy in language because the gift of language can create a career it can help somebody see the way into the future it can help somebody change from who they are to who they would like to be it will help you to see the gift of your own intellect there's an, old, there's an innate vocabulary in all of us that helps us to see Helps us to translate what's going on in the world, what's happening, so that we can make good decisions instead of poor ones. We can make less mistakes this year than we made last year. One of the major things to pray for is to be gifted in language because it can have such a dynamic effect on your children. It can have such a dynamic effect on your business. It can have such a dynamic effect on your customers. It can have such a dynamic effect on your business partners that not to continually get better and better at the gift of language would be a great mistake. Let it open doors, nothing else will open the gift of your language. Let it help people to see possibilities that they cannot see now. And you join in in those possibilities and make another fortune and another fortune. All the way up the ladder as far as you wish to go. I don't know how high you need to go.
What were the instructions given to the first couple after the garden experience, Adam and Eve, according to the storyteller? We've got some Bible scholars here, I know. Instructions given to Adam and Eve after the garden experience. Here they are. Number one, multiply. It's a lonely place, just two people. Multiply. But here's one now that is so extraordinary, and I'm going to cover a little bit more of it during our ongoing uh, session here today. Here was the second one. Be fruitful. Be fruitful. Kind of an interesting phrase. When I lecture in other countries, sometimes it's difficult to find the right translation for be fruitful. Here's what I think fruitful means. Be productive. It might, the example might be a tree, a fruit tree. Plant a fruit tree. Now, why do that? It's very simple. Teach it to your children. Number one, to survive. The first instinct is to survive. So be productive enough to survive. Be productive enough for your own survival. But is that the end of it? And the answer is no, that's only the beginning of it. To produce enough for yourself is only the beginning. What's the rest? Here's number two. Get married. Now you've got to think of ways to produce more than you need for yourself. And guess what that does? It elevates you to a higher life. If you want to live this higher life of a companion, a wife, getting married, see that now changes the dynamics of your future. It's called stepping up to a better life. And to step up to a better life, here's what you simply do economically. You learn to provide and figure out a way to provide more than you need for yourself. You think of ways to provide enough for yourself and for someone else. Why think of someone else? Why not just think of yourself? Because that's a very limited way to live, just thinking of your own survival. If you want to live a more flourishing, unique life, you must think now of someone else. So now the man says, I must produce enough for myself and for my wife. Is that the end of the life experience? No. Now have children. Take a risk. Having a child is like a throw of the genetic dice. Who knows what's coming? <laughs> See what happens. But now a man who now wants the experience of having children must now think of ways to produce enough for himself and for his family. Someone says, why do that? Why not just take care of yourself? Because that's such a a beginning way to live. Survival is okay, but it's not the good life. Now take it a step further. Jot this one down. A man now figures out, because he's learned now, he's experienced, and he understands what life is all about. Now he figures out how to produce more than he needs for himself and for his family. Just jot the word down more. Keep thinking more. How could I produce more than I need for myself and for my family? Someone says, why do that? And the answer is to live a higher life because now you can be generous. Now you can support worthy projects. Is that it? No. Here's the next one. To produce much more than you need for yourself and for your family. Someone says, why do that? And the answer is to live this higher life. What if you earn $10 million one year and you and your family only needed $3 million? That would probably take care of the average family, $3 million. Some families are more expensive than others, but let's say $3 million would pretty well take care of most families. But you made $10 million. And you and your family only needed three million. Now you've got seven million to give. Wouldn't you like to live that kind of life? Someone says, why do that? 
And the answer is the possibilities of economics are so available that if you wish to, you can not only earn enough for yourself and for your family, you can earn more than you need for yourself and for your family. And if you really wanted to, you could earn much more than you need for yourself and for your family. Is that it? Let's take it one step further. Just jot this phrase down. Figure out a way to earn far more than you need for yourself and for your family. Gary talked about Mark Hughes. I met Mark when he was 19. I still do a lot of work for Herbalife around the world. He started this little company when he was 22, 23, called Herbalife. And he died just a couple of years ago. Mark Hughes, age 44. Guess what he left? Number one, a company worth $680 million, according to the new investors. Here's what he left his son, $350 million. Estimated wealth he created for those who worked for him during the 20 years he was alive, about $3.5 billion. Imagine having the zest and having the wish and having the desire to create billions in wealth, not just for yourself, but for others. 350 million, nice little nest egg for your son. Somebody says, why do that? <laughs> Can you think of the best answer ever? Jot this phrase down, why not? Right? What else are you going to do? Just hang in there until the bitter end? No. Why not see how far up this economic ladder you can possibly go to see if you can't live an extraordinary life? Not just an ordinary life. That's okay. Survival, that's okay. You and your family, that's okay. But if you could think larger than that so that you really go to work on seeing who you could become, in terms of influence, in terms of productivity, in terms of living the little phrase I give you called an extraordinary life. Ordinary would be okay. Extraordinary would be the best. Isn't this good stuff? Couldn't wait to get here and tell you about it. I can hardly wait to hear what I've got to say today. <laughs> okay, so number one, to take advantage of the 21st century, let me make sure I'm on track here. To take advantage of the 21st century, learn multiple skills. Let me give you one more now. It would be useful to know more than one language. When I travel the world, I have to have translators. The only way I can speak to someone in Japan or speak to someone in South Africa or speak to someone in Israel or speak to someone in uh, um, Europe, most of the time, I have to have someone translate for me. Somebody has to know more than one language to translate for me. And their gift of knowing more than one language makes them uniquely valuable. So that would be another wise idea, learn more than one language and number two, learn more than one skill. Number two, learn more than one language. When I was growing up, my father spoke German. He was German, but he never taught me German. I could have learned it. My mother was English, but she, all, she spoke French, but she never taught me the French. When I was growing up, they said, you know, leave the old world languages behind. This is America now, English, English, English. Now we know much better. My parents, I could have learned three languages as easy as one growing up. So, if you think the time has passed for you to learn that second, third language, make this note now. It's one of the best for the day. Give it as a gift to your children. Encourage them to learn the second, third language, as many as they can learn. I asked a teacher one time, how many languages can a child learn? And she said, as many as you will teach them. They don't lack curiosity. They don't lack capacity. They only lack a teacher. Don't let your child develop 10% of what they're capable of. Don't let them develop 15% of what they're capable of. Give them the opportunity to learn 
as much percentage as possible of what they're capable of. And for yourself. So multiple skills, multiple languages. Now what's the rest? Taking advantage of the 21st century. Jot these notes down. Have you got this? So why don't we erase it if you haven't got it? I've got five key things to talk about <clears throat> during my presentation for the day. Five. Five good basic ideas. These are called basics. Fundamentals. And it's interesting that I only have five. How many fundamentals are there to anything? Here's a good phrase. Just a few. Meaning anybody can learn them. There's just a few fundamentals to being healthy. If someone says, I'm going to teach you the 50 fundamentals to good health, you say, well, that doesn't make sense. There's not 50 fundamentals to have good health. There's just a few. Six, seven, eight, that's about it. If you want to learn to play basketball, you've got to learn the fundamentals. How many fundamentals are there to the game of basketball? Just a few. Five, six, if you become extremely gifted, maybe seven, eight, that's it. That's it. Now here's what's interesting also about fundamentals and basics. There's no new ones. I mean, this stuff's been around for a long time. So beware of someone who says we've got new truth. Say, no, truth is old. It can be, more of it can be discovered, but there's, there's no new truth. If someone says, I'm manufacturing antiques, wouldn't you be a little suspicious? Say, no. <laughs> so, skills and fundamentals are like antiques. They've been around forever. The law of averages I teach in one of my seminars. The law of averages. Here's what it says. If you do something often enough, you'll soon have a ratio of results. If you do something often enough, you'll soon have a ratio of results. If at first you talk to 10 people, get one to say yes. That means you're getting one out of 10. Talk to 10 more, get another one. Talk to 10 more, get another one. Talk to 10 more, get two instead of one. Why is that? You're getting better. The law of averages works for anyone. One we've learned for a long time. Here it is. It doesn't ever change. Whether it's a church or a business, 20% of the people do 80%, 80% do 20%. So here's what I learned in time management. You, you can spend 80% of your time with the 20%, not the 80%. You spend 20% of your time with the 80%, 80% of your time with the 20%. It's, you, just, you just have to learn. And these fundamentals now have been around for a long, long time. The 80-20 rule. We bring products, tapes, books, videos, right? things to buy for your ongoing education. We bring books and tapes and, and CDs and we bring all that stuff for how many people? You say, well, you'd bring enough for 100% of the people. No, no, no. 20%. You bring all the stuff for the 20%, not the 80. Isn't that fascinating? 20%. It's fascinating, people's different reaction to the same presentation. Someone walks out of my seminar and says, wow, I'm going to go change my life. Someone else walks out and says, oh, I've heard all this stuff before. Same seminar. It said the first day the Christian church was started, first day, the speaker, Peter, got up gave this classic presentation to a multitude, vast number of people. And 
What was interesting was when he finished the reaction to his presentation. It said some, some of the, I think there were like, there were thousands. It said some of them laughed at him. And I thought, why would they laugh? He seemed sincere to me. And it said some of them mocked him. And I thought, why would they do that? Then I found out they're the mockers. That's what they're supposed to do. <laughs> and the laughers are supposed to laugh. It said some that heard this magnificent presentation didn't know what was going on. And they're easy to spot. They're usually saying, what's going on, right? I mean, they don't know what's happening. But then it says this, some that heard believed. And the number that believed was about 3,000. Didn't give us the total, but out of the total, 3,000 said, hey, this is good enough to follow. So that's life. That once you learn the percentages, right? It's called the law of averages. It's one of the best studies. It's in some of my uh, CDs and, and presentations. But now, let's talk about the fundamentals of life, the fundamentals of success. There's just a few. They're basic. It's like ABCs, which I deal with primarily, ABCs. So let's go through them. Here's number one. We've talked a little bit about it by way of introductory. It's called, one, your personal philosophy. Philosophy is a big subject, political philosophy. Here's what the communists taught, because I have to deal with it when I go to Russia. The communists taught, capital belongs to the state, not the people. We've taught all these years what? Capital belongs to the people, not the state. Wow, what a difference in economic philosophy. The communists said, people are too dumb and stupid and greedy to know what to do with capital. So you've got to take capital away from all the dumb, stupid, greedy people and give all the capital to the all-wise, all-knowing state. And let the state run everything, and let the dumb, stupid people show up for their work assignment. That was the philosophy of communism. They devastated every country they touched with that philosophy. I was just in East Germany. Guess what it's taking just to clean up East Germany after the communists left? A trillion dollars. They've spent 500 billion already, and they got another 500 billion to go just to clean up one country devastated by such a philosophy. Capital belongs to the state, not the people. Well, the consequences of philosophy are unbelievably either on the good side or on the bad side. Now, personal philosophy. You know, there's religious philosophy and spiritual philosophy, and there's economic philosophy and social philosophy, okay, economic, political, all kinds of philosophies, right? Where did we come from and where are we going and what is the meaning of life? But philosophy is a big tent with many different divisions. But the one I want to talk primarily about today and then expand from that is your personal philosophy. So jot this down, one of the best notes for the day. Each person's personal philosophy is the greatest determining factor in how your life works out. Each person's personal philosophy is the greatest determining factor in how your life works out. Your economic life, your personal life, your social life, your spiritual life, all starts with the conclusions you've made in your personal philosophy. We gave the example earlier, earlier on economics. There's three or four different philosophies to choose from in your economic future. Now make this note. Personal philosophy is like a guidance system. A guidance system. And it has to start early. When a child goes to school, they've got to have a pretty good guidance system working. And this guidance system does just two things primarily. Here's number one. This guidance system helps you to see the dangers over here. 
and try to minimize those or eliminate some of those. That's one of the first orders of human existence is to learn early where the dangers are so they don't swallow you up, don't devastate you economically, socially, personally, or lose your life. Kids have to get this guidance system working early to spot the signals of the dangers that could wreck their chances to live a good life. Now, this guidance system also helps you to see over here the opportunities so that you could maximize those. So if you learn to minimize the dangers, maximize the opportunities within this working environment now, we call this working things out to live a good life. But you can't possibly live much of a good life if you don't keep learning where the dangers are so you can avoid those and learn where the opportunities are so that you can maximize those. That's about as simple as I can put working on your personal philosophy. Now, why is it this way? Why is life both danger and opportunity? Here's the best advice I can give you. The storyteller probably gives us, you know, more to think about than in detail. But here's what it seems like. And that's one of the best phrases to use if you're going to make your studies and try to come to some good conclusions. It seems like, it seems like, God wished to create for the humans he made a great adventure. Seems like. According to the storyteller, it seems like God wished to create a great adventure for the humans he created. That's the best explanation I've got, seems like. And it seems like God's always wanted some kind of adventure. It said when he was alone in heaven, according to the storyteller, he created all these angels. That must have been fun. Doesn't say how long it took. Doesn't say how many. But evidently, he sought adventure. Part of the adventure, I guess, in those early times before the creation was in heaven with the angels he created. Now then, he also creates an angel that's the best and the brightest of the angels called Lucifer. And so begins, according to the storyteller, one of the great adventures of all time. And along the way, the idea occurred to Lucifer that he could take over God's place, become God in his place. And he persuaded, according to the storyteller, he persuaded a third of the angels to go with him on this insurrection. So begins an unbelievable adventure. Seems like that's what God wishes, some great adventure. Not just sit up there and float around on a cloud. Create some angels, create Lucifer. Lucifer persuades a third of the angels to go with him in insurrection. Now they lose out, and uniquely enough, according to the storyteller, God doesn't kill them all. That would end the adventure. But rather cast them out of heaven down to earth. And so now continues this unique story of Lucifer and his, the third of the angels now cast to earth, creates another adventure. Interesting. The Bible is such a fascinating book, giving us seemingly, you know, what God delights in and seems like God delights in creating this unique adventure. Ancient, one of the ancient stories says God and Satan were talking things over one day. I thought, well, that doesn't seem possible. But the storyteller says they're looking down on the earth and they're talking things over. I thought, wow, that's remarkable. God and Satan getting together and, and talking things over. Now, the storyteller doesn't give us many details, so we've got to use our imagination. 
And on this particular occasion, God got to bragging on one of his favorite creation, his favorite person called Job. He said, Job and I have got this great friendship going. Job and I, we walk together. Job and I plan the future together. Job, Job, Job. Finally, Satan had it up to here with Job, Job, Job. And he said, yeah, God, Job, you've got a wall built around him. I can't get to him. God said, well, what would you expect? He's my favorite person. Of course, I got a wall built around him. Now, they're having this conversation. It's fascinating. Storyteller says, Satan gets this bright idea. He said, hey, God, let's try this. God said, what? If you'll take the wall of protection down from around your favorite friend, Job, he said, I promise you within a short period of time, your favorite friend will curse you to your face. God said, no, he'd never do it, not in a hundred years, no matter what. Satan said, well, how are we going to know? Would you like to make a wager? It doesn't give us the details of the wager. But the storyteller says God picked up the bet and said, okay, let's try it. I'll take the wall down from around my special friend Job. You do your best. I promise you no matter what you do, he'll never curse me. Satan said, the bet is on. According to the terms of the wager, God did take the wall down from around his special friend Job, and Satan then does one of his all-time famous numbers. According to the storyteller, first Satan took his wealth, stripped him of his wealth. Satan said, that'll do it. Where's your friend God? He didn't curse God. Satan said, well, number two, took his health. Below number two. Surely now he'll curse his friend God. No. Below number three, and the worst, took his family. His health, his wealth, and his family. Gone. Satan said to God, here's where he does it. And sure enough, Job's wife comes along and says, Job, looks like your friend God has long forsaken you. You might as well curse him and die. And Satan said, here's where he does it. And God says, well, he hasn't talked yet. And while they both listen, Job says, never would I curse my friend God no matter what happens. God said, I knew it. I knew it. And picked up the bet, whatever it was, doesn't tell us. Isn't that a fascinating story? Now, I, I say all of that to illustrate this. It seems like God delights in great adventure. And the only way to have great adventure, it seems like, is to have both danger and opportunity and us with the possibility of figuring it out. Jot this down. Now, it's a nice little list. On one from other people is to just pick up the signal. Part of it is by sight. Here's a good watchword for the 21st century. Pay attention. No use falling into the same trap somebody else fell into. No use living a mediocre life like somebody else has chosen. Take a look and say, is that what you really would like? Say, no. Here's somebody that never read the books, never made the changes. There was a class and they didn't take it, a skill and they never learned it, a discipline and they never tried it. And they blame the government and blame taxes and blame society and they blame circumstances and all the rest. They don't know. And the key is watch carefully. Don't you fall into that same trap. That's how we learn from what we see. Here's next. If we learn from what we see, we put some of this on video so you can see it again and again and again. Next, you learn from what you hear. We put it on CD so you can hear it and hear it, hear it. We don't ask you to come to just one seminar. We ask you to come and listen again, listen again. Here's what the early Christians were taught. Don't neglect the assembly. When we call an assembly, do your best to be there because you never know which of these assemblies is going to change your life forever. You'll never be the same again. 
And you can't pick the one that's going to totally change your life. You just have to do like all of you I know do. Consistently go, consistently go, consistently go, consistently take notes, consistently go to seminars, lectures, and all of the rest, because some of them will be life-changing. Maybe this one will be for some of you. The time is right, the words are right, the ideas are right, the moment is here. We don't know. We just come as many times as we can, be affected by as much language as we can, and see what that'll do for our sight and our ambition, our willingness to develop skills, be a leader, influential. Here's the next thing. Be a selective listener. Don't just load up on stuff that isn't going to count. We all need a little humor, but not that much. Life is a pretty sober place. It's life or death. It's success or failure. It's flourishing or mediocrity. This is a serious matter. So, make sure that what you listen to gives you the full range, a good diet of things to listen to. The positive, yes, but the negative also. We need to hear it from both sides. Okay. Years ago, I saw an advertisement once on Roseanne. Tune into Roseanne, white chicks talking trash. I thought, oh, America needs more of that. Now, you don't need much of that, white chicks talking trash. Here's a good note. This is a good one. My teacher taught me when I was 25, stand guard at the door of your mind. Stand guard at the door of your mind. And you decide what to listen to, what not to listen to, how much time to give to what. Now, the third one is important, and when we come back this afternoon, we'll continue it. But here's number three. Read all the books. Now, there's millions of books, so you can't read all the books. But here's what I mean by read all the books. Read all the books you need to read to make your fortune become powerful, influential, healthy, prosperous, aware, bright, helpful, partnership, father, mother, grandparent. Read all the books you need for your life to flourish and become the best it can possibly be during the course of your lifetime. Read all of those books. Don't be short on that list. My library certainly won't do it. I've only written four or five books. I'm working now on my fifth, I think it's my fifth book. It's going to be for teenagers and college kids. And I think the title is going to be, Of Course Kids Should Pay Taxes. Of course. It's going to be an interesting book on capitalism, because I teach capitalism now in Russia in very simple form. I might give you a couple of notes on that when we return. I teach kids how to have two bicycles, one to ride and one to rent. And it doesn't take long to get into business and make a profit. Here's what changed my life and helped me make my first fortune. Jot this down. The philosophy that helped me make my first fortune. Profits are better than wages. Once I understood that, it was hard to sleep nights the first year. Profits are better than wages. Wages make you a living, which is fine. Profits make you a fortune, which is super fine. And when I started at age 25, I started doing both. Making wages and making profits. Unbelievable. One simple philosophy changed my whole economic future. Profits are better than wages. Read all the books necessary. Now, I'm going to give you some that started my library. I've got one of the best. If you saw it, you'd be impressed. Haven't read everything in my library, but I feel smarter just walking in it. Right. Okay, Gary, where are you?
enough for the first go around here. We'll be back this afternoon with some more. Thank you for your patience. Appreciate it very much. God bless. Amen. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jim Ryan. Wow. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I appreciate the welcome, and it's nice to come by and have a chance to visit with you. Claude and I do go back a few years, and it's nice to be invited back. I did three lectures here last year, and it says something to be invited back. Maybe it doesn't say everything, but it says something. Maybe it says, let's give him one more chance, see if he can uh, pull it out this time. It's nice to see all of you. How many of you, this is the first time you've seen me? Can I see your hands? Okay, most of you. Uh, some of you I recognize have been back uh, a few times the last uh, few years that I've been coming to Phoenix. But I appreciate being invited to uh, come and spend some time with you. I just got back from Australia, my ninth lecture tour of Australia, and uh, got to see the America's Cup in Perth. Unfortunately, it's in Perth. But um, in 1987, we're going to go back and get it, right? But uh, life's been good to me. And after being single 10 years, uh, last year at the Crystal Cathedral in Garden Grove, California, I got married and got somebody now to share the rest of my life with. So what a fascinating journey for me. And now to have the opportunity to be invited to come by and share some of my thoughts with you and see if I can't invest some of my ideas in, in your better future. And then if I meet you a year from now, 10 years from now, you might say, uh, the day you came by and talked to us was a, a good day for me. It gave me some ideas to try. And so that's what I'd like to do in the next few minutes in the time we've got is to give you what I think are some major things that can help in putting your life together, some things at least to consider. I don't have all the answers on how to do well, but I've got some I'm using and I'm practicing and it's working well for me. So let me just share with you my experience. And then you can decide if it's valid for you, give it a try. If it doesn't make sense, just throw it out, right? You don't have to buy everything any one person says. Here's the key, be a student, not a follower. Be a student, not a follower. Somebody says, I read this book, should I follow? And the answer is no, read at least two books and make up your own mind. Right? Don't be a follower, be a student, be independent. <clears throat> Take advice, but not orders. Only give yourself orders. Make sure what you finally do is the product of your own conclusion. That's what university's for, to debate all the ideas, not just to buy them all, debate them all, and then decide what's best for you, where to go from there. But university's a great place to hear an exchange of ideas on a wide variety of major life topics, and that's what it's all about, taking the time to go through it. Now, what I'd like to give you is what I think are the five major pieces to the life puzzle. Five major pieces to the life puzzle. If we can study each of the pieces and then put it all together, the chances of it running well are just a lot better. Mr. Schoff gave me a simple formula when I first met him, and let me give it to you. He said there's usually about a half dozen things makes 80% of the difference. I thought that was a good formula. I've applied that to a lot of things. There's usually about a half dozen things makes 80% of the difference. There's about a half dozen wealth things, about a half dozen health things that can give you the 80% solution to the problem. Then Mr. Schoff said, be a student of those half dozen basic things. Pretty good advice. Success is not doing extraordinary things. Success is doing ordinary things extraordinarily well. So if you just learn to do it well, key things well, learn to speak well, poor people can talk and rich people can talk. Looks like rich people talk better. It's just learning a skill with a high degree of, of precision. Uh, learning to speak is called survival. Learning to speak well is called success. So we can speak well enough to survive or we can speak the extra well enough to <coughs> succeed. So let me give you what I think are fundamental pieces to life and um, we'll take it from there. Here's the first one, philosophy.
pretty well-known word on the university campus, philosophy. Philosophy, in very simple terms, is simply what you know. And what you know greatly affects how your life works out. <clears throat> we might also add, what you don't know greatly affects how your life works out. The idea you miss could be the missing number in trying to put the numbers in the lock. So, what you don't know will hurt you, to correct an old cliché. And to correct another one, ignorance is not bliss. But it's important to know. It's important to get the information. Now, we do something very important with what we know. We weigh it. That's another good word. We weigh. In our leadership series, we teach uh, aspiring entrepreneurs, weigh everything before you do it, before you buy it, before you try it. Make sure you weigh it. Everything you get ready to do, you get to decide whether it's a major or a minor. And you don't want to give minor things major time. You don't want to give something insignificant, significant amounts of your energy. So we simply use the phrase, way before you pay. Sophisticated people learn to weigh everything. And what we all need is a good set of mental scales to weigh everything. What if you got information and your mental scales were off and insignificant things to you were significant? Wouldn't that be a major handicap the rest of your life? When you weighed something, important things weighed unimportant. We would call that a great handicap. So it's very important to weigh everything properly. And that's the reason for sermons and songs and lyrics and lectures and seminars and, and conversations and professors and teachers. And it's one of the reasons why we converse, we converse with each other and we debate and we think about and we ponder and we perceive and we weigh and, and we try to find out where the values are. Because you don't want to proceed and give big chunks of your life to something that's insignificant. Okay. So we get information, we weigh it, then we come to conclusions. These are just some key words, conclusions about values. Big question in forming your life, where are the values? What is important? What should weigh heavy on my mind and I should give it significant time and significant energy and significant money? Okay. So all of this stuff, this is our thinking process. Chauve said to me, poor thinking habits keeps most people poor. Not poor working habits. Most people work hard, but they don't think hard. They don't use their mind to really try to perceive where the values are so that they don't waste any time. It's easy to spend big chunks of your life on insignificant things, unless you can weigh it better. Our mind. So all of this stuff, is called major. It's one of the major pieces of the life puzzle. What you think about, knowledge, how you weigh it, the conclusions you come to, the values you've perceived, thinking. If you really want to help somebody change their life, you have to start changing their mind, change their philosophy, change how they think. Somebody says, well, just motivation, that'll do. And the answer is, no, motivation won't do it. If a guy's an idiot and you motivate him, you've got a motivated idiot. Right? <laughs> Say, no, that, that's not what it takes. Now, it's very easy to make errors in judgment. Errors in judgment. I'm now the teaching people, even, out of, even after they're out of school, university, college, they should read at least uh, one or two books a week. It's easy when you get out of school, right, and get a job to just sort of let that all slide, not keep up the learning process. But if you don't keep up the learning process, uh, a lot of values become fuzzy if you don't keep trying to perceive what's important, what's not important. And then start spending major effort on minor things. So we have to keep learning. What if a guy spent his book money on donuts? Right? We would call him greatly deprived mentally. In 10 years, the guy's bought two tons of donuts and, and only two books. Right? Mostly with pictures. Right? And he wonders why his life isn't working well. Reason. After he got out of school, he didn't keep up the flow of ideas that can help to refine your business and help to refine your decisions and help you come to better conclusions. You've got to keep up the learning curve, even after you're out of school, to make sure that you're not making errors in judgment.
The reason why most people wind up average at age 40 instead of rich is simply an error in judgment about what to do with your money. What would you suggest a 15-year-old start as a plan to do with their money so that by 40 they're rich instead of average? You've got to have a good plan, right? If you start making errors early with your money, those errors can, uh, can make your life mediocre instead of rich. You wind up with pennies instead of fortune. And you, wi you wind up with crumbs instead of a feast simply because early you made errors on what to do with your money. The guy says, well, it's only $10. So what does it matter what I do with it? And the answer is, it, 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 that's when it really matters is when you don't have much. The guy says, oh, if I had a fortune, I'd really take good care of it, but I've only got a paycheck, so I don't know where it goes. We call those great errors in judgment. It's so important to make sure you've got a good plan when the amounts are small. But it's easy to make errors. It's easy not to know. It's easy to miscalculate. And if you miscalculate, some things keep adding and adding and adding. I got a good phrase for you. Life is accumulative. Good phrase to know. Life is accumulative. Our errors either accumulate into what we don't get, or our wise decisions accumulate into what we do get. Now, the key is to correct the errors as early as possible. Fortunately, Mr. Shof caught me at age 25, started asking me major questions. At age 25, he said, Mr. Owen, how long have you been working? And I said, I've been working uh, six years. I started working when I was 19. Right, full-time job. He said, well, six years, how much money have you saved and invested in the last six years? I said, not any. He said, who sold you on that plan? Wow, six years is, is enough time now to check and see if you've got a good financial philosophy. And the time to catch the errors is early, early. So Mr. Schoff started asking me those tough questions at age 25. How about your money? How about your resources? How about your investments? And you say, well, I, I've got plenty of time to worry about that and be concerned about that later. And the answer is probably not. Now's the time to fix it. Wherever you hear the good information, that's the time to start fixing it. So we're teaching kids now a good wealth philosophy. Starting at age 50, 15 will make you wealthy by age 40, 45 at the latest if you're a little slow. Start doing wise things with your resources. When, when would you suggest people should do wise things with their resources? Answer, as soon as they get the better information. Now, you can't do what you don't know, but the key is to keep learning so that good ideas keep occurring to you. Now you can do more wise things, okay? But philosophy is where it all begins, what you know. Now, to know wise things, you simply have to study, as you're doing, Keep up the reading, keep up the conversations, keep up the listening to lectures, keep going through the information, keep stashing it away, taking the notes, right? There's no better way to adjust your philosophy than to have a continual flow of ideas. But that's the first piece of the life puzzle, philosophy. Now, here's number two. Philosophy determines attitude. Attitude is simply how you feel. First, what you know sets the sail of your life. Now, how you feel starts taking you there. Attitude. Now, there's all kinds of ways to feel, right? You can feel good or you can feel bad. Here's one attitude. If this is all they pay, I'm not coming early and I'm not staying late on the job. That's an attitude, right? If this is all they pay, I don't come early and I don't stay late. Now, do you suppose that that attitude, if you carried it through the rest of your life, do you suppose that attitude would greatly affect your life as the years unfold? The answer is overwhelmingly, of course. Here's another attitude. No matter what they pay, I always come early and I always stay late to invest in my own future. Isn't that fascinating? Attitude is by choice. You can either choose to come early or you can choose to come late. You can either choose to leave early or you can choose to stay late. Attitude is a matter of choice. Now, to make wise choice, we need educated attitudes. Emotions must go to school to learn where the values are. Okay? 
Good phrase. Emotions must go to school. When kids are young, right? A three-year-old, you know, falls on the floor and kicks his feet and screams. We say, well, that's okay when you're three, but it isn't okay when you're 30. Right? As a little kid, right, you can retaliate and punch somebody out, but when you're 23, we say, no, no. You've got to learn now to take that emotion and send it to school and find out where the values are. It's okay to feel strong, but you've got to learn to restrain yourself in a society if you want life to go well for you. So attitudes now become a matter of educated choice. Educated choice. But how we feel is going to greatly determine how our life works out. Now, it's how you feel about a variety of things. Let me give you that list. Number one, it's how you feel about the past. Now, when you're young, you haven't got that much past to feel about, but I'm sure you've had some ups and downs. You've had some wins and losses, right? You wouldn't have arrived here if you hadn't have done fairly well. And I'm sure everybody has also arrived here with some uh, already pretty tough things you've had to face and decisions you've had to make. Who knows what a variety of stories there are here. I'm sure if we knew some of the stories, we'd, you know, shut mine down and listen to yours. There's probably some fascinating stories here already, some things you've been through. So part of our attitude is based on how we feel about the past. Some people are still carrying the burdens of the past. They're affected by some difficulties, some losses, whatever, and they're carrying it around like a burden. Instead of using the past as a school, uh, they're using it as a threat to their life. So part of it is solving the attitude about the past, how you feel about it. Number two, it's how you feel about the future. Facing the future, very important, key part of our life. Now, there's two ways to face the future. Here they are. One, anticipation. That's one way to face the future, anticipation. Here's the other way, apprehension. Now, most people face the future with apprehension, primarily because they bought somebody else's view. They don't have their own future well designed. So in the absence of having your own future well designed, you have a tendency to be persuaded to buy somebody else's future. Here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. Boy, it's easy to let your days be clouded by all of that. So someday, somewhere along the line, you've got to start settling for sure how you feel about the future. And how you feel about it greatly determines what you do. If you don't feel good about the future by having goals set, you take what we call uncertain steps. It's difficult to be confident about the day if you don't have your future well designed. So here's one of the keys to do about your future. Set goals. Write them down. Design the future. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to be? What do you want to see? What do you want to have? What do you want to share? Even if it all changes 12 months from now, the key is to start making a list now. The cities you want to visit, the people you'd like to meet, your health goals, your investment goals, all that stuff, start writing it, putting it in a journal somewhere. And let it all change as time unfolds. Something that you think is very important right now, two years from now, you'll say, that was kind of foolish. How come I thought that was so important, right? Because you'll grow beyond that. But right now, it's important to get as clear a picture of you can, as you can of the future. Set your dreams, set your goals. Because it's important. How the day goes is greatly determined by your confidence about the future. Now, here's another attitude. It's how you feel about each other. It's how you feel about society and the community and the country. It's very important. It's not that difficult to be a cynic. And cynicism greatly influences how your life works out. But it's also important to understand that if you want to do well, it takes all of us to help each of us. Good phrase. It takes all of us to help each of us do well. You can't succeed by yourself. It's hard to find a rich hermit. You can't succeed by yourself. You need a market. You need a society. We need each other's ideas. We need each other's collective ideas. Collective participation in the marketplace, society. Okay. So how we feel about each other, very important. 
Now here's the big one. It's how you feel about yourself. How you feel about yourself. Self-esteem, understanding your own value. Boy, if new discovery starts to unfold for you, that you've got the brains, you've got the talent, all you need is instruction, all you need is some coaching, all you need is some help, all you need is some advice, some experience, if you're headed down the wrong road, hopefully somebody's already been down that road where the bridge is out. And they come back saying, don't go this way anymore. The bridge is out. So we take somebody else's advice and we say, wow, I'm glad you came along. I'm heading down this road. So learning from other people's experiences, picking up all the ideas so that we can feel good about ourselves. You've got the talent. You've got the skill. That's what university's for. School is for is to help guide all this available potential. And there isn't anybody here that hasn't got the potential to become wealthy and powerful and sophisticated and influential and live uniquely. That's all within all of your reach. Uh, some people live uh, unfortunate lives of tragedy and despair, but uh, that's not here. You've become those few percentage points that have the unusual gift of association and awareness and exposure to the best that the country has to offer. And here you are at a well-known university with all the chances and all of the opportunities within your reach and, and with your brains and with your potential and your power and, and your drive and your incentives, no telling what miracles you can go do and what unique things you can accomplish. Uh, you'll look back on these days saying, those were good days that exposed me to ideas and philosophies and people and gave me chances and opportunities to come become somebody unique. But everybody here has got the potential, but you've got to feel that. You've got to think well about yourself. Now, self-esteem primarily becomes from, comes from engaging in the disciplines that lead to value. Self-esteem comes from engaging in the disciplines that lead to value. We don't lack potential, but to bring value from potential, we need the disciplines. Now, one of the major things that makes us not feel good about ourselves is not engaging in the disciplines. If you keep letting yourself off the hook or just ho-humming it and letting it all slide, then you don't feel good about yourself. Best is the ant philosophy, right? To feel good about yourself, do your best. Gather all you can during the summer. We call that the ant philosophy. Ants don't settle for half. They go for all, all you possibly can. Do the best you can. It's the greatest lift of self-esteem is doing the best you can. Okay, so attitude plays such an important part in the five pieces of the life puzzle. Now, what's next? Number three, first is philosophy. Second is attitude. Philosophy and attitude determines activity. Activity is what you do. Key phrase, success is a doing. You actually now have to do it. It seems as though God has designed that the major part of the value of our life is, less to, is left to our own mental genius. You've got to decide what you want to become. Then you simply have to go do it, engaging in the disciplines. Now the activity part is so important. How hard should you work when you get ready to labor, when you get ready to try to be successful in the marketplace? How many days should you spend? How hard should you work? Well, let me give you an Old Testament phrase to consider. It says, six days activity, one day rest. Now that's called a philosophy on activity, right? What should be the ratio of rest to activity? Old Testament suggests six one. Now I know that goes back a long ways. Some people said, no, six, six one's old fashioned. Five two is better. Well, you got to take a look at five two and see if it's okay. You don't just want to buy somebody's philosophy without seeing if it, if it leads to fortune and if it leads to unique things, wonderful, it's probably good. But you have to check out if five two is okay. Would uh, four three be better? I don't know, you got to check everything. I do know this, good phrase, don't rest too long. And the reason you can't rest too long is because we live in a push-shove world. Key phrase, it's a push-shove world. 
We live in a, in a world of conflict, and the conflict, at the higher levels, it's called the conflict between good and evil. That's one way to describe it. It's the conflict between uh, health and sickness. Health is simply conquering the territory and defending it against the encroachment of illness. Guess where illness always seems to be? Testing the outer edges of your health plan. It's push-shove world. So you can't relax too much and you can't rest too long. If you rest too long, the weeds take the garden. And if you don't think so, we call you naive. I got a good point for you. Make rest a necessity, not an objective. The objective of, of life is not to rest. The objective of life is to accomplish, to growth, full growth, full accomplishment, test the outer limits of your abilities. That's what life is all about. See what all you can do. That's what life is all about. See what you can do with the seasons and the soil and the seed. See what you can do with your brain. See what you can do with your talent and your gifts and your skills. That's what life's all about. See what you can do. Now, we need rest, but you must make rest a necessity, not an objective. If you make it an objective, you start falling into what we call the average syndrome. Right? People who live mediocre lives are always looking forward to getting off. Successful people are always looking forward to getting on. Successful people don't want off. They want on. They want to get on with the job. They rest only enough to gather strength. So consider that in your argument, in your debate on how hard should you work. Let me give you another Bible philosophy. I'm, my parents made sure I was a pretty good scholar by the time I was 18. And I'm an amateur on the Bible. But Here's another good philosophy. Whatever your hands currently find to do, do it with all your might. Whatever you're doing, do it with all your might. We call that philosophy on activity. How hard should you work? As hard as you can in the time allotted to labor. In leadership management lectures we teach, when you work, work. When you play, play. Don't play at work. And don't work at play. Right? Make best use of your time. When you're working, pour it on. And when you're playing, have a good time. But don't play at work. Okay. So activity, very important piece in this whole life puzzle in working. So you've got to test how hard you can work. Part of it is physical, your own physical limitation. Some people can take 14 hours, no problem. Some people 10 stretches pretty much their physical limitation. So everybody has to sort of decide how hard you can work, how much time you can put in. When you come to university, right, you got to sort of find out how much workload you can handle, how many classes can you go through, how much can you unravel, how many study hours do you need, how much effort have you got, when are you going to run out of gas, right, and you need to replenish the supply. So we all have to study our own activity habits. But let me give you what I think is the best philosophy. It is simply do the best you can in activity. We call it doing your best. That's all we ask. Simply, your best. If you want to put together a championship team, one simple requirement for all those who participate, just do your best. If everybody does their best, whatever that brings us to, number one, number two, wherever we arrive when the final count is made is okay if we all know when it's over, we did our best best. A man asked me one time, he said, I'm making about $50,000 a year, isn't that enough? What would you tell somebody? A businessman said to me, he said, my kids aren't starving, and he said, I got my bills paid, and he said, we're doing pretty good, and I'm making about $50,000 a year, isn't that enough? He asked me, what do you suppose I told him? I said, yes, it's enough if it's the best you can do. We don't call an amount enough. We call your best enough. I said, if you're capable of making a half million dollars a year and you make $50,000 a year, we call you loser. And we don't call you loser because of the difference between 50,000 and a half million. We call you loser because you're not doing your best. If you do your best and you make 10,000 a year, that's enough. 
If you do your best and you make a million dollars a year, that's enough. Enough is not the difference between 10,000 and a million. Enough is simply doing the best you can. So that's the key to the good life. When the day is finished, if you say, did I do my best? And if I'm not doing my best, why not? Do I, have I got some errors in my philosophy that says, hey, half effort's okay, just slide by, ho-hum it, cross your fingers and everything will work out, hopefully. Say, no, I don't want to take those kind of chances. I don't want to drift, okay? So activity. Just put a big question mark on activity and say, here's a major piece of life to keep checking. Make sure I'm doing my best. That's all I require, my best. A group of psychiatrists asked me to come and lecture for them in Los Angeles one time, which I thought was interesting, since I only went to one year of college. And then in the middle of my lecture, I had the audacity to say, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what I think most messes with the mind. They said, what do you think most messes with the mind? I said, I think what most messes with the mind is simply doing less than you can. It sets up all kinds of psychic problems, doing less than you can. Guess when you really feel good about yourself? When you've done the best you can. You don't even have to win the full prize if you do the best you can. We call that the ultimate winning, doing the best you can. Wow, there's no, nothing like the soaring self-confidence that comes from putting out what we call full effort in whatever you do. It's called full effort. So, activity. Now, activity leads to what? Number four. Philosophy, activity, attitude leads to number four. Results. And that's what life is all about. Putting the first three together. Good philosophy, attitude, high activity to get the ultimate called results. I got a good phrase for you. Results is the name of the game. Productivity. Now the challenge of life is a very simple phrase. Let me give it to you. I think you'll find it interesting to at least ponder. The challenge of life is to make measurable progress in reasonable time. Measurable progress in reasonable time. First, we don't want to be unreasonable with time. If you and I agree to do something, five minutes later I'm asking you, how are you doing? You say, I haven't left the building yet. You can't ask in five minutes. Five minutes is too soon. That's unreasonable. Now, if I don't ask you for five years, we call that too late. You can't wait five years and you can't go five minutes. Right? You, we all have to learn what is reasonable time to expect somebody to make progress, to grow, to change, to develop. So all of us have to learn, especially if you're going to become leaders, entrepreneurs, if you're going to have management responsibilities and work with people, you've got to understand what is reasonable time. We don't want to be unreasonable with time. But here's what else we expect. Measurable progress in reasonable time. How many years should the child spend in fourth grade? Approximately. About one. You say, well, if they're nice kids, would you give them three or four? You say, no, you can't spend four years in fourth grade. It's unacceptable. We put on the family pressure. We put on peer pressure, right? We put on all, all kinds of pressure. You can't spend four years in fourth grade. Now, wouldn't that be interesting if we applied the same kind of social pressure all of our lives? What would be acceptable to society for wise investments to have been made by age 30 so that you can really properly take care of yourself and your family. Somehow we've missed those standards, right? Shouldn't it be popular to be wealthy by age 40? And shouldn't we look at somebody who by age 45 is not at least financially independent saying, where have you been, uh, Tibet or uh, Bangladesh you probably have spent you mean you've been here all this time? Right? Shouldn't we make it a bit unacceptable not to be well off in what we call reasonable time? But what if a guy spent his potential fortune on non-essentials from age 15 to age 45? Shouldn't we call that unacceptable? 
Shouldn't teenagers ask their parents, how come we're not rich? We live in a rich country. This is America. Aren't those good questions? How about the wisdom of a good plan versus a poor plan? What if a man was a farmer and he ate his seed corn? Instead of planting it, he ate it. Wouldn't we make arrangements to go get his children? And say, the kids aren't safe. The man's insane. He eats his seed corn. He doesn't plant it. Wow. I just offer that as kind of an interesting question. If we make such pressure demands for fourth grade, why shouldn't we make those same pressure demands for the rest of life? Interesting question, right? Good debatable question. Now, part of it is we simply, society eases back on us as far as ongoing demand of results. But here's what I'd ask you to do. Make the demands on yourself. I'm asking you not to let yourself off the hook. Society will let you get by with far less than you want to be. When you get out of university, how many books will the community demand that you read every month? Approximately. About none. So if you're going to do the extra reading, guess what? You've got to develop that philosophy and put that pressure on yourself. But what I'm asking you to do is take a good look at results. Now, another reason why we look at results, results at age 25, results at age 30 on a wide variety of things, health and wealth and culture and, and sophistication and lifestyle and uniqueness. We keep checking all those results. Here's why. To see if there's any errors in activity. Guess how easy it is to make errors in activity? It's easy. We teach in our leadership series, don't mistake movement for achievement. Boy, sometimes it's easy to be faked out by being busy. Guy's busy 10 hours a day, but he's going in figure eights. The guy's not making progress, he's stalled, but he's busy. And he thinks being busy is gonna do it. Say, no, you got to be busy doing the right things. So maybe you need activity fixed. Maybe you need act attitude fixed, who knows? The guy who says, since they don't pay well, I come late and leave early. We say, John, that's gonna affect you all your life. And you've probably got the results to show it. Or maybe we need a correction of philosophy. That's why we check results. Now, here's the last piece in the life puzzle. It's called lifestyle. Lifestyle is simply how you choose to live. We call lifestyle the genius of living well. Now, here's what's exciting about lifestyle. As a subject of one of the major pieces of the life puzzle. All of us can choose, especially in this country, all of us can choose how we wish to live. Guess what you can get from your money? Joy or animosity? However you wish to live. A father takes a $10 bill and wads it up and throws it at his son and says, if you need the darn stuff that bad, take it. We call it money without style. The father's got the money, but he doesn't have the style. He studied economics, but he didn't study happiness. So let me give you the phrase. Happiness is an art, not an accident. Some people have figured out things economically, but they haven't figured out lifestyle to live well. Culture is a study. It's not an amount. Somebody says, if you have an amount of money, you'll be cultured. And the answer is no. Cultured is a study. Cultured, culture is a refinement of the mind. To be cultured, you must study culture and practice culture. Money doesn't solve the culture challenge. Money doesn't solve the happiness challenge. To be happy, you've got to study and practice happiness. And Mr. Shove taught me all the simple ways to get joy from substance. <clears throat> A sophisticated gentleman knows that a rose on time is more valuable than a thousand dollar gift too late. It's not the amount that counts, it's the genius that counts. It's the ideas that count. 
So here's what I'm challenging you to do. How to be happy with what you've got while you pursue what you want. And I'll give you time to make a note of that phrase because I think it's so important to wrap it up. How to be happy with what you've got while you pursue what you want. So I would challenge you in the last piece of the life puzzle, find ways to live uniquely. Now, if you look at your life on all these five pieces, this is why I'm asking you to just go back through and review these notes. How am I doing on philosophy? Are there some things I don't know? Am I making some errors in judgment that's going to bring me to no good end, right? Three years from now, five years from now. Key phrase, 10 years from now, you will arrive. The question is, where? Good question, where? And the follow-up is, now's the time to fix the next 10 years. Now's the time to fix the next 10 years. And hopefully, with the discussion of these five subjects, we've given you some uh, viewpoints, at least from my experience. And uh, hopefully, I've done a little coaching here today, and you can take these subjects and debate them and talk about them and think about them, and they'll help you with life in the future. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate you inviting me to come by. Do something different the next 90 days than you did the last 90 days, like picking up the books to read. Do something different like the new health disciplines, relationship with your family, whatever it is, doesn't matter how small it is. If you'll start doing different things with the same circumstances, since we cannot change the circumstances, but we can change ourselves, we can change what we do. And then he gave me another secret to success when he said, what you have at the moment, Mr. Rohn, you've attracted by the person you've become. What you have at the moment, you've attracted by the person you've become. Few little simple principles here. Once you understand these, it starts to explain so much. Now, sometimes it's a little tough to take blaming yourself instead of the marketplace, taking responsibility instead of putting it off on someone else. Those, that transition sometimes is a challenging mission and this one was a little tough for me. Show said, here's the secret, Mr. Rohn. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I got that, it turned my life around. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. He said, if you work hard on your job, you'll make a living. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune. If you would have known me at age 25, you would have said, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. If you'd have known me, you'd have said that. I'm the guy, I don't mind coming a little bit early, staying a little bit late, I don't mind that. You'd have said, well, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. You'd say, well, how come he's got pennies in his pocket and nothing in the bank and behind on his promises? Well, I was a hard worker, but I was working hard on my job, not on my so, I'm telling you, if you'll learn that simple little principle and start the process today, latest tomorrow, I'll give you tonight to think it over. <laughs> and start this whole process of personal development, work on yourself, make yourself more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, you can so dynamically change your income and economics is the least of the values that you can start earning in terms of equity if you'll start working harder on yourself than you do on your job. Work hard on yourself and develop the skills. Work hard on yourself and develop the graces. All of the stuff necessary to become more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, your whole life can explode into change. Promotions, no problem. Becoming more valuable to the company, I'm telling you, no problem. Money, no problem. Economics, no problem. Future, no problem. If you just go to work on the right thing, not get things out there to change. Don't try to change the seed. Don't change the soil. Don't change the sunshine. Don't change the rain. Don't change the mix of seasons. Let the miracle of everything that's available work for you and start working on the inside. Work on your philosophy. Work on your attitude. Work on your personality. Work on your language. Work on the gift of communication. 
work on all of your abilities. And if you'll start making those personal changes, I'm telling you, everything will change for you. It's Mr. Schoff over a five year period before he died at age 49. He taught me some extraordinarily simple things. He only went to the ninth grade in school, never finished high school, never went to college, never went to university. So he put his ideas and his experiences in very simple language, which I think for me, you know, a kid from the farms of Idaho, uh, that simplicity was so important. Because if it would have been technical, I'd have missed it. If it would have been mystic, I, you know, I would have, you know, backed away. But it was just basic, blunt, ABC, familiar stuff that I hadn't thought of before. And he did start to remind me, and those ideas changed me. Mr. Schoff was the one when I said, you know, this is all they pay. He said, you've been working six years, Mr. Owen. How come you're not doing better? And I said, this is all the company pays. He says, well, that's not true. I said, no, this is my paycheck. This is all the company pays. He said, no, this is all the company pays you. I thought, that's a new way to look at it, right? He said, doesn't the company pay two, three, four, five times this amount to other people? And I said, well, yes. He said, well, then this is not all the company pays. It's all they pay you. And if you qualified, wouldn't your income grow two, three, four, five times? I said, I suppose. So he said, we don't have to work on the company. We have to work on you. See, that was the beginning of what he called the phrase personal development. I told him things cost too much. He said, no, you can't afford them. I thought, well, that's a new concept. I hadn't thought about that. You know, we put some of the valuable things on the high shelf, so you can't get to them until you qualify. If you want the things on the higher shelf, you've got to stand on the books you read. Every book you read, you get to stand a little higher so you can get the things on the higher shelf. See, I learned those concepts. It was so incredible. And here was the most important one. Success is something you attract by the person you become. See, that phrase changed my life. Success is something you attract by the person you become. Success is not something you pursue. It's like chasing a butterfly, you can't quite catch it. Success is something you attract by becoming an attractive person. See, those were new concepts to me. I'm just working hard trying to make a living. Here's what he said to me. This changed my life. I got a chance to teach this in Moscow and across Russia. Three visits, now the fourth. Here's what Shof taught me. Profits are better than wages. Nobody taught me that in high school. Nobody taught me that. I went to one year of college. Nobody taught me. Profits are better than wages. Wages make you a living. Profits make you a fortune. And how could you work on both a living and a fortune? He said, well, you could start part-time working on your fortune while you're working full-time on your living. I thought, wow. Now he said, it's fun to get up in the morning. Not just getting up, go to work to pay the rent, but to get up to go to work to make a fortune. First to make a living for my family, second to make a fortune. And he taught me how to make both a living and a fortune. Guess what I did? I learned how to make both a living and a fortune. And I found out anybody could do it once they get the information. And at age 25, I started receiving this extraordinary information. Here's what he said. Your income is directly related to your philosophy, not to the economy. I thought no one ever told me that. I kept hoping the economy would change. He said, no, your philosophy has to change. I assured him that I had my fingers crossed. He said, that won't help. Then what could I do to change my income and multiply it by two, by three, by five, by 10, and then multiply it by 10 again? What could I do? And he started giving me the disciplines and the process of learning the skills to change my life. This was an extraordinary man. Those were extraordinary times for me. Life changing in every manner that you can imagine, but very simple ABC concepts. Here's what I learned. Not to search for the exotic until you've discovered the basic. And those basic philosophies that he shared with me during that time were life-changing. Success is something you attract 
by the person you become. Success is not something you pursue, chase, run after. Success is something you develop, something you become. You attract success. So the whole key to unlock all the treasures, whether it's economic treasures or spiritual treasures, financial, social, personal, every way you can possibly think of, is by your own personal development. And then he added one more, which is so important, and it's probably worth the price of the seminar. Here it is. What you become is much more valuable than what you get. What you become is much more valuable than what you get. The major question to ask on the job is not what am I getting here. The major question to ask on the job is what am I becoming here. Not what am I getting, what am I becoming. So it's very important what you become. Because what you become attracts. If you become cynical, you attract cynicism. What you become attracts. So this whole subject of personal development was so vitally important to me. It changed my life. I was a millionaire by age 31. And that was just the economic part of it. It took me six years from age 25 to age 31. It was unbelievable. Remember, be a student, not a follower. And here's what you must always do. Design your own personal life. I'm very happy for people to take notes at my seminar, but I'm also just as happy if somebody says, hey, this is not for me, tear up all these notes and throw them away. That, that's just as valid for me, right? Remember, be no one's disciple, chart your own course, make what you do the product of your own conclusion. What I'm saying here is be your own person. You don't have to be a model of someone else. You don't have to do it like anybody else, right? Do it like yourself. Buy what you want to buy, listen to what you want to listen to, make changes if you want to make changes, and don't make changes, right? It's your life, I'm telling you, and don't let anybody persuade you any different. Success is not a stereotype. Success is not a Ferrari. Success is not an automobile. It's not a house. It's not a place. It's not money in the bank. It's not a million dollars. That's not success. Success is the continual unfolding of the design of your own life and pulling it off. That's what success is. The continual unfolding of the design of your own personal life and pulling it off in whatever degree you wish, that is success. Successful in doing whatever you want to do that makes sense to you, for you, your family, your responsibilities, or take on responsibilities or refuse responsibilities. That's strictly all up to you. We've been given the power of choice. Every life form except human beings operates by instinct in the genetic code. Now, why not human beings? Because here it is, we've been given the dignity of choice. We're not like a robot. We're not stuck like a tree, using up all the nourishment, nothing left, now you die because you can't change location. Not true. Humans can go north, south, east, west. Humans can change, do anything they want to do. We've been given the dignity. But here's what's interesting about all life form except humans. Every life form except humans strives to the max of its potential. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it possibly can. You never heard of a tree growing half as high as it could. No, no, that is impossible. A tree grows as high as it can, drives down every root it can, produces every leaf it can, extends itself as far as it possibly can. Every life form extends to the max, except human beings. Now, why not human beings? Because we're not robots. We've been given the dignity of choice. And here's a couple of alternatives on the dignity of choice. To be part of or all of, you have the potential to be. And you got the choice. Do a little to make yourself comfortable and forget the rest, or do it all. And there's nobody here to dictate you got to do it all. That's nonsense. You got to be rich because we live in a rich country. That's nonsense. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to do it all. You can do a little, do some, do some more. Take advice, but don't take orders. Take information, take training, take teaching, but don't take orders from no one that tells you how you need to live and what you need to own and what you need to do. Somebody says, well, you need to be successful. That, that's a personal choice, being successful. What we teach is the possibilities, the possibilities, and everybody chooses. Take a little, take a lot, do some, do nothing. Abraham Lincoln said, since I would be no one's slave, I will be no one's master. Excellent philosophy. 
If a guy says, hey, I'm soon cashing it in, I'm heading for the mountains. I'm going to live in a little cabin, live off the land, and feed the squirrels. If he goes and does that, guess what? He's a smashing success. Why? He's doing what he designed to do and went and did it and pulled it off. You can't say, no, no, that, that's not successful. That is the epitome of success, is giving a design to your life and go pull it off, making progress in that direction that satisfies you. If it doesn't satisfy you, make alternatives and you change. And if you get some better ideas, sure, you may follow someone's suggestion and ideas, but not orders. Design your own life like you want it that will fit. Now, if you take on some responsibilities, now you got to consider those. Yes, you can ignore your responsibilities, but you won't feel good about that. Guess what the old prophet said? Some things that taste good now in the mouth turns bitter later in the belly. So you don't want to sacrifice. We all must suffer one of two pains. Regardless of your choice of lifestyle and what you want to do, we must all suffer one of two pains. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. And what we suggest to everybody is to consider the discipline because disciplines weigh ounces, regrets weigh tons. You don't want to substitute a, a discipline for a regret. In our opinion, that would be a poor choice. Now, you can do it, but some things are poor trade-offs. The old prophet said, what if you gain the whole world, but it cost you your soul? Would that be worth it? And with a bit of intelligence, we say, no, that doesn't seem worth it. Even if you got the whole world, if you traded your soul, that experience would be so bitter and so awful and so devastating, it wouldn't be worth it. What if you got some gain by greed instead of legitimate ambition? I'm telling you, it might taste good up front, but it's going to turn bitter in the belly. And a bit of that advice saves some people from devastation. Say, well, you're right. I better think twice about that. So we must confront all laws, spiritual laws, agricultural laws, basic laws, fundamental laws. We must confront all of those. But you still now can design your own life a little, a lot, go east, north, south. Now let me pass on one great rule to you which has been discovered in interviewing self-made millionaires. Self-made millionaires look into every failure for something good. They say there's got to be something good in this that I can benefit from and surprise, surprise, they always find it. Second is self-made millionaires always seek the valuable lesson in every setback or obstacle or temporary failure and they always find the lesson. Now, what do failures do? Failures whine and cry and think about what they've lost and blame their problems on someone else. Successful people say, what can I learn from this that will make me smarter next time? And my promise to you, those who seek find, is that if you go looking for a valuable lesson in the biggest problem that you're facing today, you'll always find the lesson. Here's another possibility. Your biggest problem today could be the biggest gift that you have ever received because it may contain within it the lesson that will make you successful. If you stop thinking about what happened and who's to blame, and you start looking for the gift within your problem, sometimes it can transform your life. The next key is to dedicate yourself to lifelong learning. Now, what takes you from rags to riches is personal development, personal professional development. In the 21st century, as Peter Drucker says, knowledge and skill are the keys to the 21st century. And the only thing that will be relevant, the only skill that will be relevant in the 21st century is the ability to learn new skills. Because virtually everything you know is becoming obsolete at a rapid rate. Stephen Covey says that your current knowledge base has a half-life of two years, which means that half of everything you know will be irrelevant within two years. And two years from now, half more. So if you're not continually learning and upgrading your knowledge and skills, you're not staying in the same place. As Pat Riley says, the basketball coach says, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. If you're not constantly learning, you're actually falling behind. So here are the three keys to continuous learning. Number one is read in your field 30 to 60 minutes each day. In other words, turn off the television, turn off the radio, put aside the newspaper, and just read in your field. The very best places to read, by the way, are books. Read books, the best-selling books written by the most successful people in your field, because books contain a wealth of riches that can enable you to function at a far higher level to get much better results than you than, than you could before so read 30 to 60 minutes a day I've had people tell me countless people over the years 
that reading an hour a day has doubled and tripled their income within a year. The second thing you do is take every course that you possibly can. The courses and seminars that are available to you in your field that are given by professionals that are courses that have been developed over years and years and years. They have been tested and tested and tested. The person who is talking to you for several hours has spent thousands of hours learning their subject. They have dry tested this or, or done test runs with thousands of other people. When you take a course, you can learn enough information in one or two days more than you could learn in two or three years or maybe even a lifetime all distilled and put together people say I can't afford a course you cannot afford not to buy books you can't afford not afford not to go to courses some years ago I had a dentist and he was a very successful dentist I was recommended to me by a friend and this dentist retired at the age of 53 and just before he retired he sold his practice for about two million dollars just before he retired he told me why he said about eight years before he had attended a dental con congress in Hong Kong his front, this is from California. He'd flown all the way to Hong Kong to attend this International Dental Congress because there were specialists giving private lectures, sort of plenary sessions on the side. And he attended this session, and it was on a particular technique of cosmetic surgery that this dentist had developed that no one else knew, where you could basically straighten out a person's entire front jaw so they looked beautiful at a very low cost, at a very high level of effectiveness. He came back and he began implementing this in his practice. People began flying from 500 to 1,000 miles away. Every dentist sent their, their families, members and themselves to this dentist. He was able to charge whatever he wanted to charge. He said eight years later he retired as a self-made millionaire at the age of 53 to enjoy his money for the rest of his life from what he learned from one session at one convention at one course. Now that's, that is a true story and maybe it's an exception, but you can never tell where the information is going to come from. The third uh, way that you can upgrade your skills is listen to audio programs in your car. The average driver drives sorry, 500 to 1,000 hours a year, 25 to 50,000 miles. If you listen to audio programs in your car, according to the University of Southern California, you will get the equivalent of almost full-time university attendance just listening to learning material as you drive around. It can totally and profoundly change your life. Very, very important. Here's an interesting point. The more you commit yourself to becoming the best person you can be, the more you like yourself and respect yourself, the more energy you have, the bigger goals you set for yourself, the more you persist. When you invest in yourself and you read and learn and upgrade your skills, you're telling yourself, wow, I am a person with a great future and it's up to me to maximize my potential. And your self-esteem goes up, your self-respect goes up, your sense of personal pride goes up, and you started to get promoted more and paid more in, in every part of your life. Get around the right people. This is a key for becoming a self-made millionaire. Dr. David McClellan at Harvard did studies for 25 years looking into why it is that some people succeeded greatly in life. What he found was that as much as 99% of your success in life is going to be determined by what he called your reference group. Your reference group are the people with whom you habitually associate. They're the people that you associate with at work, the people you associate with home, your church, your political party, your social circle. What he found in working with people is that changing a person's reference group totally transformed the way they think. Why? It's because we are like chameleons and we absorb through the skin the attitudes, the opinions, the behaviors, the style of dress, the style of speech of the people with whom we associate most of the time. If you start to associate with winners most of the time, you find that they have a totally different worldview. They're positive, they're upbeat, they're focused, they're learning, they're growing, they're positive of what they're doing, and you start to become like that. Next is be prepared to climb from peak to peak. One of the keys to becoming a self-made millionaire is to realize that life is never one continuous train, it's always up and down. So it goes up, like if you climb a mountain peak, you have to go down into the valley before you climb the next peak. So all of life is cycles and trends. All of life is cycles and trends, and there's up cycles and there's down cycles, and there's up trends and there's down trends. The question is, what is the general direction of your trends? We say this, is that life is two steps forward and one step back. Successful people focus on the two steps forward and then they protect themselves on the downside so that each time there's a step back, there's still a series of problems. They never end. The problems just keep on coming, like the waves of the ocean. The only break in this unbroken series of problems will be the occasional crisis. So life will be problem, 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 crisis. It's like the waves of the ocean, six problems and a crisis, six problems and a crisis. Which means that everybody here is either in a crisis right now, has just gotten out of a crisis, 
or is just about to have a crisis. So what we have found is this, the hallmark of superior people, 30 years of research, is how you respond to a crisis, how you deal with problems and how you respond to a crisis. And what we have found is this, is superior people look for the solution to every problem. They don't allow themselves to become upset and angry when something goes wrong. They say, okay, what's the solution? And they become intensely solution oriented. When you have a very intense problem, that stimulates creativity to solve the problem. So what you do is you write and define the problem clearly. If you have a problem, you say, wait a minute, what is my problem? What is it that I'm worried about? And write it down. And the very act of defining a problem clearly often triggers the solution to the problem. One last technique that I want to give you with regard to your major definite purpose. And if you only do these two things as a result of our time together, they will transform your life. You've already identified the one goal that can have the greatest positive impact on your life. Now what you do is you take that goal and you write it at the top of a page in the form of a question. And you say, let us say you, your goal is to double your income. That could have a major impact on your life. You say, what are all the things that I could do to double my income in the next 12 months? Write it as a clear question. Even better, if you're earning $50,000 a year today, right? what could I do to earn $100,000 over the next 12 months? The more specific the question, the better. Then you devote yourself to writing 20 answers to this question. You must write a minimum of 20 answers. Work harder, work smarter, start earlier, stay later, change occupations, upgrade my skills, whatever it is, keep forcing yourself to write till you've written 20 answers. We call this mind storming. The first three to five answers will be easy. The next three to five answers will be difficult. The last 10 answers will be incredibly difficult. But I have given this exercise to people who've gone on to become millionaires so many times I've lost track because they often find that the 20th answer changes their whole life. And if you've ever done this once, it's absolutely staggering. More people have become millionaires with this simple idea of mind storming, what I call the 20 idea method, than any other single method of creative thinking ever discovered. Once you've got your 20 answers, pick one answer and take action on it immediately. Once you've got, it doesn't matter what it is, just take one answer and take action on it and that will keep you thinking and acting creatively all day long. And the next key to becoming a self-made millionaire is to become an unshakable optimist. Unshakable optimist means that you think and talk about what you want most of the time. Optimists think and talk about what they want. They look for the good in every situation. They seek the valuable lesson. They're constantly feeding their mind with great ideas, which opens up new perspectives. What I have found is that optimists have three wonderful qualities. Number one is they learn more things. As a result, they dramatically increase the likelihood that they will learn the right thing at the right time. Number two is they try more things, which dramatically increases the likelihood that they'll try the right thing at the right time. And number three is they persist. They never give up. Optimists make a decision that once they've decided they're going to become wealthy, they just never stop until they achieve that goal. Now, will they have many setbacks and obstacles and difficulties? Do you know that almost everybody succeeds in a different direction from what they originally intended? or from what they originally thought, but they just keep going. Almost like a football player running down the field, running, blocking, changing, moving back, forward, continually, but never loses sight of the goal. So optimists learn more things, try more things, and persist longer. I want to leave you with the last two qualities of self-made millionaires. Second to the last quality is that they develop the qualities of courage and persistence. I said before the biggest single obstacle to success is the fear of failure. The antidote to the fear of failure is the habit of courage. And what we know is that you need two types of courage to succeed. The first type of courage is the courage to begin. It's the courage to launch with no guarantees of success. Someone once said that if all obstacles must first be removed, nothing will ever get done. So successful people are willing to think, plan, make decisions, and then take action with no guarantees. We say leap and the net will appear. Take action with no guarantees and then learn. The second part of courage is the courage to endure. It's the courage to persist. It's the courage to keep on keeping on. It's to make the decision in advance that you will never give up. No matter what happens, you will never give up. You will get knocked down over and over again, but you'll never give up. And the interesting thing is if you make that decision in advance, you'll find yourself continually bouncing back. So courage means, it means the courage to begin and the courage to endure. And the final quality of self-made millionaires, and Napoleon Hill called this the master key to riches, after studying 500 of the richest people in American history, he said it's the quality of self-discipline. It's the ability to make yourself do what you should do, when you should do it, whether you feel like it or not. 
The quality of self-discipline is the quality that will make you a big success. It's the ability to force yourself to do what you know you should do. And here is the wonderful discovery. This persistence is self-discipline in action. Every time you persist, you build your self-discipline. Every time you practice self-discipline, you build your ability to persist. And the two of them are tied into your self-esteem. So the more you persist, the more you like yourself. And the more you like yourself, the more dis discipline you have. And the more discipline you have in practice, the more you like yourself. As a result, the more you persist. And eventually you get onto an upward spiral where you become absolutely unstoppable. You reach the point where you know you can achieve the goal and nothing in the world can stop you. And every step that you take forward makes you stronger and stronger and stronger until finally people say, I know one thing about him, I know one thing about her. You cannot stop him or her. Once they decided they want something, they will not stop until they get it. And when you develop that quality, there will be nothing that is impossible to you. So let me just leave you with these last points. We're living at the very best time in all of human history. More people are going to make more money in the next few years than have ever been made in all of human history. More people are going to become millionaires and are becoming millionaires today at a faster rate than we've ever thought possible. And no one is better than you and no one is smarter than you. And if you do what other self-made millionaires do, then nothing in the world can stop you from eventually getting the same results as other self-made millionaires. And I hope you do.